Uh, so thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak to you all today and good afternoon I guess for everyone over there so it's 9am in the morning for me so I'm just waking up um, but yeah thank you very much for having me and it's been great to hear from all the other speakers today um, on this important topic. Um, so I'm going to be talking a bit about plastic air pollution and uh, we've, we've heard a little bit already from uh, Dr. Cial who was uh, talking about microfibers and so I'm just going to give you a little overview uh, about this issue and some of the work we've been doing in uh, Imperial College London. Okay, so we've obviously had lots of facts today, so I won't spend too much more time uh, reiterating things. But um, as of uh, 2015, we had produced over 6 billion tonnes of plastic since its mass production began in the 1950s. And 80% of that plastic, which is equivalent to almost 5 billion tonnes, uh, was released to landfill or to the environment. Um, as of 2010, approximately 12.7 uh, million tonnes of mismanaged plastic waste had entered the marine environment from coastal populations, uh, which of course is quite a significant number for a single year. Um, and what was perhaps more uh, surprising for me was that rep that figure represented 40% of the mismanaged plastic waste in those communities. And so what that actually meant was that the majority was on land. And so I think we, we recognise plastic as, as a marine issue, and it certainly is, but it's also one that's in rivers, that's in oceans, and that's now in air as well, and you'll see why. Um, so we've been talking a lot about plastic and, and plastic leakage, but I'm interested in microplastics, so the leakage of particles from bigger pieces of plastic. Um, so microplastic is defined as a, a solid synthetic polymeric particle of no more than five millimetres in their maximum dimension, which may contain additives or other substances regular fragments and granules and even uh, tyre wear from car tyres. So moving on to microplastic pollution, it follows a source to sink pathway in the environment. So there are definitely point sources of emissions or release, and there are definitely areas where it accumulates, but it gets to those areas via different pathways. Um, so they form through chemical degradation, that's upon exposure to sunlight. Um, whilst they are a persistent material, they do become uh, weak over time and, and become brittle and fragment into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, but they're also formed through abrasion, such as we've heard through the microfiber issue. Um, so the wear and tear of clothing, of carpets, um, even opening a plastic bottle will create microplastics from a plastic lid uh, because of that abrasion. And this is across the whole plastic life cycle. So it's not just the old bits of litter in the environment. It could be new bits of plastic which are abraded as well. But they're also manufactured in, and intentionally added. So here are some examples of products microplastics are purposefully made and put in. So fertilizers, cosmetics, um, industrial detergents, cleaning products and paint. Um, and they are ubiquitous in the environment. So they contaminate the marine environment, the deep ocean floor where up to 1.9 million microplastics per meter square can be found. Um, they contaminate rivers and land as well. And those are some of the values you might find for those different spheres. So they're an environmental concern um, because laboratory studies, uh, albeit using higher concentrations than you might, might encounter, but still um, giving an example of the plausibility of the effects that could manifest, include things their uh, manufacture. They could carry contaminants, which they've absorbed from the surrounding environment, and even microbes. Um, and now we found them in dust, in food, uh, in drinking water, in soils, and in air. So they really are becoming this public health concern too. So microplastics in the air, it isn't really uh, a, a, new, a new idea. Um, for anyone who's worked on microplastics, you'll know how hard it is to prevent contamination of your samples in the lab. And that's because the lab air is contaminated with all these microfibers and things. And even as, as early as 2014, you know, researchers were publishing papers to say we need to, you know, publishing um, standard operating procedures to reduce 
background contamination from the laboratory air. So we kind of know they're airborne. It makes sense. They're low weight. They're small. Of course, they could become windborne. Um, and so as early as 2016, researchers started to find microplastics in samples, which indicated they had once been airborne. And so these two studies measured microplastic in atmospheric deposition. So in dust that was naturally depositing out of the atmosphere, there were these synthetic particles in there too. So you can see for Paris, there was around 110 particles for a meter square area depositing each day. And for China, that was a, a little bit less at 36 microplastics for a meter squared area every day. And so back then, we'd also started asking this question too, because I was working with an air pollution team who I still work with today because we have interest in particles and health and, and toxicology. Um, and so I was really interested in whether microplastics contaminated the air too. Um, and so we asked this question for the air over central London. Um, so again, we collected bulk deposition 50 metres high on the campus rooftop uh, in central London. Um, we would collect our samples using uh, ultra-filtered water on a, on a collection surface. And then we'd take that back to the lab and we'd filter it, we stained it, we did some microscopy, and we also used a method called for air transform infrared spectroscopy to fingerprint the composition of particles in our samples so we could truly know whether we were looking at plastic or not. So this is what we found. We found that microplastics were present in all our samples. Uh, we found over 90% of the microplastics observed were fibres, and that's shown here on the, uh, on the left, as you can see here. Um, so 10% of our particles were non-fibrous, so fragments and beads and granules and things. And this is our total uh, deposition rate across time here. And here are a few examples of microplastics we observed in the samples. So we saw beads, irregular fragments and fibres too. And here's an example of the, the distribution of the types of plastic we found in the air. So for the fibres, which is shown in the red pie chart, you can see they were predominantly composed of polyacrylonitrile. And that's uh, an acrylic fibre, synthetic fibre. It's used for outdoor tarpaulin, outdoor textiles, coats, clothing, things like that. But it's also a filler in cement and concrete. Um, so aside from saying what it's made of, we couldn't really say exactly what it had come from. Um, for the non-fibres, you can see we have this real range of different plastic types, which largely reflect the most common uh, plastics produced and used in society. And so how did this look compared to other places? Well, we found on average over 700 microplastics per metre square per day were depositing out of the atmosphere. And so compared to other regions, this is the highest uh, reported so far. But quite importantly, a very pristine remote mountain region in the French Pyrenees actually receives quite a high level of microplastic particles to that region. So it's not just urban environments that are affected by this type of pollution. It's also suburban and rural and even uh, uh, pristine areas too. So microplastic contaminates air around the world. Here's a, a figure taken from an article by Zangatel, which really just illustrates all the regions where they've been observed. Um, so the black dots uh, represent atmospheric deposition samples, whereas the grey uh, is, is also um, other types of pollution, such as uh, suspended ambient air. And what you can see is they've been found across the continent. And this isn't quite up to date because there's recent papers which also have found microplastic contaminating the northern US as well. And so what are the common characteristics and trends that have been found so far in terms of this type of air pollution? Well, they're mainly comprised of either fragments or fibres. Uh, the main types of polymers are either poly polyethylene terephthalate, polyethylene, polystyrene, polypropylene or polyamide. Of course, these factors all depend on the type of sample, the geographic location, um, the type of the environment and the analytical methods used as well. Um, but mainly these are secondary microplastics, so things that have broken down from other pieces of plastic. Um, but there's also evidence for primary as well, such as the uh, microbeads I mentioned. And what is becoming apparent is that levels tend to be higher in urban or in indoor environments. So where are these coming from? So this is back to our study in London. We looked at where the air masses were originating from and how that linked to the level 
Also here, this is for the fibres and the really red sort of heat map shows the intensity of the fibre abundance and the air mass, which is which is um, basically that has originated from. So you can see when we've got high levels of fibres, they actually seem to be mostly concentrated around London, which actually suggested that the city could be a source of this itself. Um, and the same goes for the non-fibres as well. We were really seeing where we saw the highest levels of plastic or microplastic. These were coming from, uh, from really from in central London. So we were hypothesising that maybe cities are a source um, of microplastic and, and they could be a source of microplastic to more remote regions. And of course, that makes sense when you think about where it's used, where it's produced, where it's disposed of. Um, it's typically around you know, uh, population centres. So here's just a study from uh, the northern US, which I mentioned, again, showing uh, plastic deposition, microplastic deposition. And this was in pristine habitats, so in the national parks of the northwest US. Um, but what they actually found was a similar, similar story in that urban centres um, and resuspension from agricultural soils were principal sources for the deposited microplastics they found in their samples. So here's just another um, example. This is for tyre wear. So this map here is showing the emissions of tyre wear um, to the atmosphere. And you can see in heavily populated or densely populated areas where we've probably got a lot of traffic as well. Um, you can see the darker areas show where there's the higher emissions of um, tyre wear debris to the atmosphere. But where is that going? Well, again, this same paper from Evangelou et al. last year, um, they modelled for both two different size fractions of particles, uh, tyre wear particles in air. Here are the smaller ones, the two point. is that they're really widely distributed across the globe and that also oceans may be a hot spot for deposition. So land in itself as a large scale environment. microplastic cycle um, throughout the world and throughout different environments. As I mentioned, the ocean, not only do microplastics deposit on the ocean, but the ocean is also a source of microplastic to air. And so uh, recently a study found that sea spray um, was essentially a source of microplastic. So as this is blown onshore, um, microplastics at the sea air interface are entrained in the droplets and bubbles and are essentially blown back onto land as well. So it really does form a, a sort of microplastic cycle. And so there's lots of attention and, and headlines building now. You know, this is clearly, it seems to be an urgent issue if, if microplastics are airborne. And of course, most importantly, it raises the issue of public health, as does any type of air pollution, because it normally means it's quite discreet, quite dispersed. And, you know, we, we obviously are exposed to things in the air as well. Um, I mentioned particulate matter size fractions, so particulate matter or PM. Uh, these size fractions are important and they describe the aerodynamics of particles in the airway. So particles that are PM10 uh, microns in size behave in a way that would mean that they deposit um, once inhaled in your central airways or to reach the deep lung, and we call that PM2.5. And why are these important? Uh, you've probably heard of, of it in an air pollution context in general. It's because these are linked to uh, cause for deaths around the world. Um, and each of these size fractions of air pollution are, are also linked to cardiovascular and respiratory diseases as well. So we know that particles in general in these size fractions are associated with a range of health effects. And that's been shown through epidemiological so population level studies. Well, of course, we don't know. And as, as toxicologists, I'm sure a lot of people are interested in what is it within that particular matter which is driving this? Because clearly different components are going to have different potencies and drive different effects. So in microplastics research, there's what I'm referring to as a size data gap. So this is a, a summary of the studies up to June 2020, which had looked at microplastics but there's nine studies that uh, looked at bulk deposition, so atmospheric deposition. The limits of detection were 10 microns. fractions. And what this means for health and exposure, clearly uh, these particles linked smaller things where we use a technique called Raman microscopy. So this 
vibrations that are occurring materials change the energetic state of a laser which will intercept your sample under a microscope and that reads off as a, as a kind of chemical fingerprint if you like so here's a, an example for a polyethylene terephthalate fiber um, you can see the fibers spectrum or fingerprint is in black and the reference one for PET is in red uh, and we use reference libraries to match our fingerprints from our samples um, to classify and identify what they are and the good thing about Raman is its spatial resolution allows you to do this for particles down to around a micron in size for most um, most routine instruments that are used in labs and again we can also use this in an automatic way uh, whereby we can take an image and for every pixel in that image collect this fingerprint or this spectrum and then we that enables us to map the chemical composition across that whole image and so here again you can see this is this PET fiber in a sample and we were able to determine it was PET because we could map where PET was in that whole image and it coincided with where the fiber was. And so we've used this uh, imaging technique, this Raman imaging, to first of all show that we can detect different types of plastic. So this is reference material, uh, but it's important to show the method works. So here each panel represents a different type of plastic in a plastic mix. And again, for reference particles, we've also shown that it works for particles down to two microns spiked into a particulate matter matrix. So these were two important steps we had to take to prove that this method was appropriate for what we wanted to do and that we could apply it to real world samples. So when we applied it to real world PM10 samples, and this is for an urban uh, roadside sample, um, we found that microplastics were present. So here you can see our size distribution of the microplastic particles we found. And as you can see, they peak at around 10 to 12 microns, and there are even some down to um, five microns in size too. And here are some examples of the pretty nondescript particles, which you probably just take for granted looking at them, but were actually found to be composed of plastic. And we found the concentration of microplastics in this PM10 fraction to be uh, just over two and a half thousand microplastic particles per cubic meter of air. But what does that mean? So there's a lot of particles in the air. And just considering the size of, of particles between 2.5 and 10, which we call PM coarse, um, in terms of the particle number concentration, that's typically around a million to a 10 million particles per cubic meter. And so our fraction, the microplastic fraction, is probably quite small, but that method definitely comes with issues. Um, so things like that smaller particles will affect the intensity of your signal, which means you might not get a good spectral quality. And if you don't get a good spectrum, um, then you obviously don't match it successfully either. And things like coatings and weathering can also affect things. So um, I'd say this is a start. It's definitely not a perfect method to use. And we're working on alternatives right now to improve that. And of course, so really, this really does build on the question, there's hardly any evidence, we really need to start addressing what's the relative contribution of plastic um, to our particle exposure, but ultimately, what's the relative potency of these different particles? Is there an issue about microplastics specifically, or is it just that they're part of the PM mix? And we know that elevated concentrations of PM can lead to respiratory effects and respiratory disease. Um, but also, is there a mixture effect? Does the fact that plastic is there in PM, um, is it collecting metals and or, um, persistent organic pollutants from the PM mix and actually uh, magnifying our exposure if we encounter a microplastic in the air? Um, so there are lots of different questions to answer and lots of reasons why they might be a public health concern. So is it a public health concern? Well, they're definitely present in air but they are an analytical challenge, which explains this size bias data gap. They occur in a size range which is linked to respiratory and cardiovascular disease. And there are occupational studies published which do link exposure to high levels of respirable plastic dust to interstitial lung disease, um, amongst other types of effects. Um, and so really what we need to move this forward are standardised workflows, um, which enable us to quantify the microplastic fraction in PM10 and 2.5 so that we can understand exposure and ultimately estimate population level effects as we do for PM10 and 2.5 in general.
So what can we do? This isn't my area of expertise. I think it was all the other speakers who did a really great job of saying this. And I think the one thing I want to just flag is that obviously it's a complex issue and I'm just interested in the small particles. Um, so whilst we stop the bigger leakage of things, how do we stop the release of the smaller particles? And I think it's a combination of stopping the leakage of larger bits of plastic to the environment so they can't degrade in the first place. But we've obviously also got to think about how we use them and the materials we use because we don't want to create microplastics during use um, and we definitely don't really want to be exposed to them during use um, just as we want to minimise exposure to particles in general. Um, so with that, I just want to end. I want to say thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you could all hear me okay and see, see my screen okay. Um, here are just some of the uh, papers I've mentioned if you're interested. Um, I want to thank all my collaborators who've helped build this body of work so far. And I want to thank you all for listening. So thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Stephanie, for your valuable time. Say no!